morning. Morning. Who's taking the notes today? George, you're muted if you're saying something. I got them today. Thank you. I think we're ready to go. Um, morning, everybody. Today, it's mostly tech demos um, and tech discussions of upcoming well, some features that have recently been introduced and some ones that have been in the works for a while. Uh, so, Kevin, you want to start? Trina, you want to start? Sorry, yeah, one minute. I was just asking there were a few folks in the channel who were asking a bunch of questions i was just telling them if they want to join the sync meeting uh <clears throat> anyways I, I guess if they reply i will give them the link but i can start i have uh, two very quick things and then i will give it to he and uh, i guess katrina so uh last time when we met we we talked about that we were going to present at uh, Linux Foundation. Um, oh, one second. Uh, one of the folks wants a link. Let me give them the link. Or, or can you just post the link to Thomas Kislin? Can somebody in the Slack channel? Yeah, so last time when we were talking, we, uh, we said that we would be presenting to the Linux Foundation AI and data DAC about uh, adding flight to the to the uh, to their projects roster and uh, so we did a presentation thank you for some of you guys who attended the presentation it was early in the morning at 6 a.m and uh, on that was a thursday before last and we were approved with majority um and let me share my screen um the <clears throat> the approval is done, but we have not completely announced it yet. We are uh, we are slow in announcing, but if you see this, there is flight as part of the Linux Foundation AI and data interactive landscape. Um, and we are getting the entire thing set up. Uh, if you still scroll down to the projects within the LFA and data umbrella, you won't see flight, but that should be coming probably next week. Uh, the current set of things that we are working on is, uh, getting everything set up within the flight arc so that LFA and data owns the trademark and so on. Uh, the next set of things is essentially we, we want to create a proper contributing guidelines and so on that, that, that are in line with the usual Linux Foundation project. 
uh, the cool part about Linux Foundation is they don't really they don't really um, control how a project governance is managed. We we can control it as a community, but we would like to adhere to some some set of standards that you know other popular projects have, and that way it's clear, transparent, and open. So uh, ideas are welcome over there. We we have done a few things. We'll share that in the next. Um, few uh, meetings. One of them is we are trying to create GitHub teams for every uh, repo. And we would love uh, folks who have been contributing to various repos if they, they are interested with the responsibility of maintaining those repos. Um, that would be, would be amazing. Uh, <clears throat> beyond that, uh, as the contributors come in, the usual style is to create a fork, work on the fork, and um, and then pull, create a pull request from the fork, unless you become a committer uh, into the or a con compute, committer into the repo, then you can directly open a pull request against the repo. So those are some couple simple contributing guidelines. Uh, please let us know if there are any questions. The the path to so the we are currently an incubating phase. From incubation, you move to a graduated phase, uh, and for that we need. Uh, three things really. Uh, one of them is usage in terms of like five major companies or five organizations in any, in, doesn't need to be major or anything, but five organizations, uh, distinct organizations need to be contributing to the code. Um, then you would want to work with five other projects within the landscape of, or three other projects. Uh, and so some of them are very interested in collaborating with us, which including, including data, uh, observability, uh, machine learning, um, like neural network, uh, serialized formats like Onyx or a distributed framework like, like Hollywood. And then the third part is just more than some number of GitHub stars. Um, I want to say that we are over the number of GitHub stars that we need, but it would still be like, if you know, that helps us spread the word. So please star the repo if you have not already. And then if you have, then thank you. So that's a quick update on uh, Linux Foundation. Um, and we will be forming a, a, a technical advisory committee within the project. Uh, and it will compose of the folks that you see are more active in the uh, Slack channel. That doesn't mean those people have all the rights. They are just there to make sure that the project is governed and uh, moves in the right direction. But that, com uh, that committee constantly will keep on getting updated, more folks will get added, and, and, and we'll keep on improving uh, how we govern the project. So uh, thank you for being part of the, commu uh, the community, and and uh, we're just getting started in this you know, bigger journey now. On the other front, so I had a second topic that I wanted to talk about. Uh, oh, rather, this is just a demo. So now if you go to the docs page and you say, hey, how do I monitor my, my deployment? You can click on the monitor deployment, it gives you a tip and you can read through. But basically what this is, is uh, a bunch of Grafana templates that have been posted to the Grafana marketplace. Uh, and so in the way the Grafana marketplace works is you can go to a Grafana dashboard and you can say add, sorry, import, and you can give it the ID. So in this case, let's say we want the admin dashboard. You can give it the ID. I think I have the dashboard already. So when I try to load it, it's gonna say like, oh, it's already exists. But if you see, yeah, it gets an identifier and you can select the data source. In this case, we are gonna select the Prometheus that's local to this cluster. And once it's set, uh, I'm just directly gonna to jump to the dashboard. It should directly open up this dashboard. So this is for admin. Um, in the admin dashboard for every API, I hope I've covered every single API. If not, I will show you how this is generated. But uh, for every API, we have a bunch of different metrics. Um, you can change the time and everything else as in Grafana. Uh, so for example, we are running something right now. So you can see like how the latency is and how many ops are running and how, what's the latency. And, if you notice the latency is high at this point, um, same thing you'll observe for every single API. The other 
a more interesting one so uh, is from the user point of view. So when a user runs something, they usually want to know what's happening in their project domain and if, if their workflows are running. So then this gets generated automatically. This is the flight user dashboard. Uh, again, this is via Prometheus because that's the only one that we're going to publish. If you want to use other data formats, you're free to take our, uh, or even contribute, that's even amazing, or take our base uh, templates and modify them for your formats, uh, like, or your backends, like CloudWatch or- uh, hey, hey, Sorry to interrupt. I think your screen isn't sharing. We're just looking at the overview of your dashboards. We're not actually able to see the individual ones. Oh, really? Yeah. This happens all the time. It just stops like, and I better now. Can you see the flight user dashboard? It's all black now for me at least. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I don't know what I can do. Hmm. I can start sharing again. No? Maybe sh share something else in some other way. Um, hmm. Let me try and share my entire desktop if that might work. Can you see something now? So all black. Okay, so my computer doesn't want me to share, but trust me when I say. <laughs> you want us to try? Yeah, if somebody else can share, that'll be awesome. I can give the link here. Sure. Actually, you have the link, right, probably. Can you see anything now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is this the link you want me to show? Yeah, uh, so can you click on the user dashboard? Yep, so these are the user dashboard, essentially from a user point of view. At the top, you can select the project and the domain that you work on. So in this case, we just have one. This is from a sample cluster that has one. And you can select the workflow um, yeah, and you can use all as every workflow. I don't have much data here, which I should have generated. But if you scroll down, uh, if you're using Kubernetes, then it will show you what's the current quota usage in Kubernetes. Um, so are you using uh, how many bytes? And maybe the maybe I need to tweak the, the uh, units here. And if you scroll down further, uh, if there are any errors that are happening, are these user errors, system errors, if, if specific tasks, it will show you what breakdown by type of task, like if you're running queries versus you're running Python versus array and so on, and how what's what's failing, what's succeeding from a user point of view. And this is just a starting point. We can definitely improve on this further. So if you scroll back, same thing is available for propeller. Uh, and if you on the left on the left pane, uh, yeah, if you go to dashboards home, yeah, go to dashboards, not to home. Yes, it doesn't show you all the dashboards. <laughs> uh, I guess you have to search, is it? Is that the only way? So there is another dashboard that I recommend adding and that is um, the Go dashboard, which is just available for free on the um, on the Grafana dashboard, if you search for Go metrics. Uh, the cool part, it, it actually, all of our services are written in Go, so you should get all of these metrics for free. They should show you what's the current memory utilization and will help you in optimizing performance or debugging any issues with propeller or admin or anything. Um, I have been, I've been using them to optimize uh, some of our uh, backend systems. All right, uh, where is this code uh, written? So if you go to uh, the flight repo, under the flight repo, there is a stats folder. Maybe. Um, so all of these are using the Grafana lib library, which is a library that's published by Grafana. So you, these are programmatically created uh, dashboards. So you just create the dashboards. The, the query is the, or the expression is the most important thing. The expression here is Prometheus query language. Uh, so if you are using different backends, you'll have to alter those. 
But if you are using any Prometheus compatible backend like TSDB, uh, no, not TSDB, the, the Uber one and a couple others, then they all should just work. And so if you write them, uh, you can just import the dashboards and set the target to be your data source and it should work. If you want to add anything more, please go here. These are pretty straightforward dashboards uh, and they are generated using make stats on the top uh, in the root and that's it. Uh, so, and I, I, there's documentation on it. So you can use that to refer to the, to the home link of where things are. That's it from my end. All right. Thank you. Awesome. It's a long time coming. Let's see, uh, Yi, you wanna go? I think Katrina was going to go first. Sure, I can go. Yeah, all right. Cool. Um, awesome. Let me share my screen. Um, all right. So map tasks. Um, let's take a look at an example here. So map tasks are kind of a new concept in New Flight Kit. Uh, there is an equivalent for them, which we'll go over in just a bit. Um, it'll like it, but a map task is kind of a specialized case of an existing dynamic task, in which case you can take any single Python task. In this case, we have um, this really simple uh, mappable task that takes in an integer, produces a string. And from that, we can create a map task, which will basically map over a range of input um, and call this mappable task with each input. So in this case, this is the syntax for producing this map task here. Um, this is kind of new, it's a little funky, it's different than the way we kind of uh, define other tasks in Flykit, and we're always looking for feedback. So the syntax does seem a little bit intuitive. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, but as you can see, it takes in this mappable task. It can also take in additional metadata um, that every individual task takes in, such as uh, retries. You can pass in resources here as well too, and this all gets applied to the individual map task. Um, that gets yielded when this uh, uh, overarching map task is called for a collection of input. In terms of using this, you can just call it just directly like any other task that you would um, in a workflow definition. So in this case, you see that it takes in a list of integers, which is that uh, list collection of that int interface for the underlying task. Um, important caveat for map tasks is they can only take in one uh, input and produce one at most one output. Um, we're going to work to change this, but there's some limitations with uh, FlightKit right now that we need to kind of refactor through um, before we can get to that. Um, and as you see here, they produce output, map tasks produce outputs just like any other tasks, and you can pass those as inputs to other tasks that take in that full collection interface. Um, and you can always run those locally as well, too. Um, and we get our weird string of 34567. Awesome. Um, we can also run this on hosted flight, which is kind of where um, the advantage of map task comes into play. Um, so here you can see here's our, our map task and then our coalesce task. Um, we've run them here. Um, sorry. So again, we pass in this little list of inputs. We produce that collection of outputs. Uh, we actually produce logs for every single um, subtask. Um, unfortunately, the pods get read too quickly if you're using Kubernetes, um, so the, the logs don't quite work on the Kubernetes backend, but you can also use AWS batch to um, uh, as your uh, like map task uh, ex execution environment, um, and that's kind of really where uh, map tasks shine because this lets you scale up uh, to you know, say like thousands of tasks that you can run on uh, an AWS batch queue uh, remotely. Um, and all those can be configured with different sorts of uh, priorities um, and rules and whatnot. Um, which lets you kind of scale beyond your cluster that you host flight on. Uh, we can take a look here. Here's our graph. Um, you can see our map task, our coalesce task. Awesome. Um, cool. So going back to um, uh, dynamic tasks. Um, so and I guess kind of as an equivalent for map tasks in um, old flight kit, and I guess current flight kit as well too, because dynamic tasks have been ported over to new flight kit. You can see, you can kind of approximate this map task pattern um, by yielding a, a bunch of the same task for uh, a range of inputs. 
Um, but this is all done dynamically, which is to say that this is compiled at execution time. Um, it's going to be a little bit slower to run through, uh, and you're not going to get all the kind of like type safety checks that you would ordinarily um, in a statically defined task. Um, so this is where map tasks are also kind of uh, an improvement on the existing paradigm, uh, because this will all be kind of statically defined, um, a little bit of improvement, performance improvement as well, too. Um, so we definitely encourage you to use those. And again, feedback is welcome on the syntax as well. And that is it. Katrina question. So map yeah. tasks can be used inside dynamic tasks as well, right? I think. Yeah, yeah. They're like any other task, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to mention that. So you, it's still recommended to use map tasks when possible instead of the for loop way of iterating and probably important to understand what the distinction is. Do you want to go into that? Um, yeah, so I guess the like the map tasks are have kind of like a limited interface as well too and then the dynamic tasks you can do that for loop style like iteration and then coalesce those tasks or do additional processing within the dynamic task map tasks do have that kind of stricter interface you would need a separate task to consume those outputs um so that's just it's i guess kind of like a yeah a stricter interface but um at the same time it can still accomplish the same thing as dynamic tasks uh, but dynamic tasks can also yield all sorts of things, right? Like it doesn't have to be the same instance of the task, like range for an input. They can, you know, use all you know different types of tasks as well too. And you don't quite get that in a map task. So just stricter subset of functionality. Yeah, but uh, just to add, like from my point of view, the the reasons to use map tasks is um, a much tighter control over the performance characteristics. Um, what happens if you if you create a graph in dynamic, which is thousands and thousands of nodes, um, they actually consume a lot of um, memory in the back end to, to represent and they consume because they have to be compiled and they have to be uh, they have to be stored and their, their status while executing has to be tracked and, and flight propeller has no way to know that they are all the same. Now there is some work over there to actually coalesce dynamically into a array task, but uh, that will happen in the in the uh, longer term. But if you use map task, it's essentially giving a hint to propeller that they all are uh, they all are essentially uh, one uh, one unit, and so they get represented in the execution point as one unit. And uh, there are lots of advantages of doing that. Like for example, we know that the shape of the task is identical. That means the container is the same inputs are kind of similar and so on. So in, eventually we could actually reuse containers as they are coming up. We could, um, we can actually prioritize uh, throttle, control them. The status itself is compressed. We use bitmaps internally to represent how they are progressing. Uh, so, so they are very optimized in the backend and especially handled. So my recommendation would be if you're just gonna run one task over a large corpus of data, um, just think of partition, then it's better to use map tasks. Uh, and that's why we formalize that pattern as a separate entity within the system. Okay. I'll go next. Okay. So I, everyone can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to go over, I wouldn't call this a roadmap, but just some talking points on maybe what people can expect in the next few weeks, few months. Um, so flight kit can be thought of from the contributor's perspective, at least um, in three end user perspective, the three main uh, areas. One is the authoring side where you're actually writing tasks and workflows and launch plans and all, all that stuff, map tasks and dynamic tasks and all that. Uh, one is execution side, which is what happens when the container containing a flight kit defined task is spun up and executed on a flight backend. And one is control plane objects. These are previously and still currently known as SDK task workflow launch plan. Uh, workflow execution, I think is one that's very commonly used. These allow programmatic uh, in Python script access to the control plane, kind of like a flight CLI or flight CTL for uh, Python objects. Um, with the map task PR, we're mostly pretty much done with the new API. Um, we 
there's some cleanup that we need to do. We'd always need more testing. We're kind of looking, I think maybe someone's helping us look into better testing frameworks in general. And I'm sure we'll find a lot of bugs as people adopt it more. Um, and there's a question of whether or not we can, or we can't, but how to define workflows imperatively. Um, so like, you, instead of having a user write an app workflow decorator to decorate a function, um, uh, be, allow the user to be able to define a workflow like with a for loop, for instance, iterating over the nodes. So that needs to be done, but that's a small addition. Um, and after that, on the authoring side, we'll have like very broadly speaking, just continue to plug in work. Uh, we want to add support for uh, things like local caching and intro task checkpointing. These are features that I think will let users get more out of like kit by itself um, as a standalone thing and um, improve uh, utility of it in general, even on the back end. And we, there's some um, enhancements we need to do to the typing schema that's not just FlightKit that will go beyond. Um, and then we are soliciting ideas in general for uh, developer experience improvements and contributions, of course. Uh, the control plane side, I think, is the next big chunk of work that will start. We kind of want to revamp everything to work with the new type engine that's uh, deployed with the new API. So that will take, that will probably start on that this week or next and we'll continue, uh, we'll hopefully won't take more than a few weeks, uh, but we'll see. And lastly, on the execution side, um, some uh, someone at, I think Spotify um, asked us to for a pattern that we couldn't support. And we realized the reason we couldn't support it was because of a limitation in how tasks are instantiated at execution time, uh, the task being the, the Python instance itself. Um, so we have one, I put in a PR, uh, it's not merged yet for people to review. Um, it is PR number 404. So just to give a quick overview of it, Currently, when a container comes up, the Python instance of the task is instantiated by looking for these um, two options to the click command, uh, the module, and then the name within the module to, uh, to load. And this only, this has uh, a bunch of limitations, namely the, um, the module and this, basically, namely, the name of the task has to be at the module layer. It can't be nested. So we introduced a, this thing called a task resolver. You can take a look at the um, the doc string that I added. But basically, you still need to start with um, we're giving it a resolver, and the resolver itself still needs to be uh, accessible from the module level. So you can't, this default task resolver can't be nested. But from there, you can pass any arguments you want to it. Um, so the arguments for the default one will look very similar. I stripped out the dashes, but basically it's just this what we have today. And um, this is what the new one would look like. So um, no, actually, let me, this is another example of what, so if you, sorry, let me take some back. Uh, you can, we basically added this mixin to the workflow class itself in this PR, which allows you to do things like this, uh, basically, which is not previously possible. This lets you define a task inside the body of the workflow itself. Uh, this is nested, so it is typically uh, without this PR not possible, but with it, the, the workflow itself becomes a resolver and the workflow knows how to locate the, um, the which task it is to run. Um, 
the because the workflow itself ends up being the resolver, the workflow itself definitely has to still be at the module layer. Uh, but if it is, then you can do uh, stuff like this, which will allow you to define. Uh, I, th I think it's more useful for SQL tasks, but um, or at least it looks cleaner for SQL tasks. But uh, you can decorate tasks and call uh, Python function tasks or any other task type you want. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. You can you scroll back to the resolver pattern thing and show the example where you were using the builder? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, can we just pass that one second? Uh, line number 35, right? Yes. So the point of this is that this becomes, this is a nested function that gets retrieved from this thing here. Um, and this becomes the body of the task. So uh, I think a typical use case would be if you want to write a class where you want to put inputs and outputs of the query, but have the process inside just a you know, process method, like very simple, right? This is the simplistic workflow that anybody can have, like take inputs, process and produce outputs. You can now uh, encapsulate that in this kind of a pattern, which is what's shown on line number 35. There's no outputs here, but you could have put outputs. Is that right, E? Uh, the task has an output, I believe. No, no, no. When I say like as an output, like if I want to take some data oh, from yes. BigQuery, generate, a, you know, dev, train a model, and then take the model and you know deploy it to a model serving layer, or actually write the output of the validation uh, or you know execution of the model to BigQuery back. You could write that as one line. Yes, right? I don't have a follow a subsequent step after the process. Yeah. And uh, I guess like to maybe give. Uh, some context about the Spotify use case because I found that also interesting use case. Uh, I, I, I imagine others might want to replicate. Do you want to speak a little bit about that, Yi? Uh I'm not entirely sure what what it is. I, uh, yeah, so, so the, the uh, I think the, base, the basic version of it is they, they wanted to provide their users um, uh, their own DSL. They want to write, um, you know, some code in here, and then their users would use uh, uh, would just write, or or they won't expose uh, certain constructs to their users um, that don't quite follow the paradigm of writing workflow tasks, all statically defined, and so on. Um, and and with this, uh, now they can uh, completely customize. Uh, how those tasks and workflows are loaded at execution time. Um, the maybe caveat is there should be zero um, like randomization or non-determinism in how that logic works. Uh, it should always load it, like the same task every time you call it with the same inputs, obviously. Uh, but it's it's a very powerful construct and can imagine others would want to expose different DSLs the same way. Yeah, actually, this makes it possible to essentially write new DSLs and in any any order as long as they're deterministic. But you can write a YAML DSL using the Python SDK. You can write a um, you can write like the single line DSL, which is very very popular for some of the machine learning projects um, and uh, even for some simple data processing paradigms. I have one question. This looks great. Like it's very similar how it works in Java SDK. Where, but in Java SDK you can just give a string like one name, but here you can actually pass more parameters. So I think I, I like it more. Uh, but like I mean, when I, when I was thinking about it, uh, like a, one way to go is just to serialize the whole object. Yeah, that's and what many this people does. don't like it. Like, like, but but does it? Oh, it does serialize the whole object. Okay. Uh, and I played around with this and then I added, I should make this an explicit warning, but basically this, even like the hello world example, uh, once you add a closure, it becomes very large. 
uh, and then the command line, it, you basically, it has to be offloaded somewhere. So that will uh, require changes to admin as well. So, which is why there's a huge caveat in this. Yeah, so Gleb, but it is, we don't serialize all the time. This is an experimental cloud uh, pickle resolver. So that means you can extend how you want to uh, do it. So tomorrow, if you want to support Jupyter-based, fully cloud pickled objects, and if that's your game, uh, like it won't stop you. You can do that. You can completely upload it, and data will just run from Jupyter notebooks directly onto Flight. Uh, that comes with its own caveats. <laughs> you should you should know what you're doing, uh, definitely. But uh, yes, it's possible. And and I think the serialized objects is the way to make it the interaction really fast. Um, I, I think that's where you get into. Right. Yeah. Basically, the problem with combo line and what Java SDK does, it needs to pass a list of jars. So it actually creates a JSON file with a list of jars that are also, and then it uploads this file and then it links it. Uh, but if there was like a way to read, let's say custom from container, like even just have it on GCS or whatever, it would solve it. Yeah, why can't you do that? Why can't you just serialize, let's say not a JSON, but like have a protobuf format, which is pretty, small and then compress it and send it on the command line just yeah, yeah just you have to do it basically yourself but because there is like a custom field on each task just yeah. for me uh, it would be comfortable at least to have it like accessible it's yeah. like extra overhead to always pass it but i mean you can just pass so many useful things there and as well as there is like extra things like labels and annotations and just have a way to access it from container tasks as well it would be very useful i think I think you are absolutely right. I think both uh, we were discussing whether we should take the task template and just send it down into the Python SDK. And that would that would solve a lot of different types of problems. And one of the things today is that if you want to run a SQL task in Python, you need to have the container build with the SQL, even though SQL is completely portable. Uh, and so what you could have done is essentially have one, a library of containers that just are doing, let's say, they have SQL Alchemy in them or other ORM in Java. Um, uh, and, and then you could just pass the query to it and it could do a query on any database, potentially that the ORM support. So yeah, so that's, we we did talk about it. I, I think we will be doing it. Uh, we would love to experiment with, if you are ready with it, Lev, I, I think that's a trivial change in the backend. We can pass that in. It's pretty trivial. Uh, if you pass it, then I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that's awesome. Let, let's actually discuss because it, it's not a big change at all in the back end. Chief asked a question in the chat about uh, when does the static chat type chapping occur when we're doing the dynamic workflows? Or, uh, Chief, do you want to <laughs> verbalize your question? <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering, um, you know, when you when we register the workflows and tasks and stuff like that, there's a lot of benefits of uh, having uh, our tasks and everything be type checked. Does this also still work with this model? Which model is resolver stuff? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes. I mean, yes. the the command The command to the container is the only thing that changes. All the other compilation steps are still being done. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Jeep. So the, the in this during the serialization phase, we will run the same loader command essentially to load your tasks, serialize them, so extract the inputs and outputs, including the types and so on, and then, then register it. And then at runtime, it's again run to actually load it back and reconstruct the task. Got it. Yeah. So it's it's essentially the same. It's like just a different way. Instead of using import module all the time, we are saying let's have a customized import module. Got it. Thank you. I think that's it for the agenda today. Does anybody have anything else they want to bring up? All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I think. I, the map tasks look awesome, Katrina. Thank you very much. Uh, and we will I look forward to deep, more deeply understanding what 
<laughs> you just described because it's a little mind bending from my perspective, but uh, I'll look forward to digging into it a little bit. Uh, thanks everyone. We will see you in a couple weeks. Uh, there's on in the meeting notes, it's posted uh, at the top of the meeting notes are topics that are sort of up for discussion. Anybody wants to volunteer? That list is totally edible. Anybody wants to change, add to that list? Go ahead. It's a real low-tech system, but um, it should be free to comment in the doc, or you can DM me if you want to add something to that or you want to demo. Um, and we're always welcoming any, you know new presenters who are working on new stuff uh, uh, to show off what you're doing. That's the most fun demos we do. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.